Right, so today we're talking to Pascal Derrien, who is the CEO of the Migraine Association of Ireland. You're very welcome to the show, Pascal. Thanks for having me, John, and kudos to you on getting my surname right. You're very welcome. So, uh, for a start, I'd ask you not to go into the different types of migraine, but you might tell us what migraine is and how it affects. Oh, absolutely. So, uh, I tried to give you a a short lowdown on actually on, on what it is. And what I propose is, pro before we talk about the services of uh, Migraine Ireland, is to give you a bit of a context about migraine in Ireland, the condition. Yeah. So, first and foremost, uh, migraine is not just a headache. Uh, and I'm going to labor the point probably throughout uh, the, the interview today. Um, it's a complex neurological disorder. Uh, roughly 600,000 people uh, suffer or experience migraine uh, in Ireland. Uh, the WHO does rank migraine as one of the first and most disabling chronic conditions for ladies in particular in their prime, 25 to 55. Um, also, I would add that the ratio, uh, or the gender ratio, should I say, is 70% ladies, 30% uh, male, but also children in some instance, maybe around you know 5%. Um, Migraine, actually, there's more than one migraine. You have seven or eight yeah. or nine types of migraine if you have comorbidities. So migraine is not an homogeneous condition and also has no uh, biomarkers per se. Okay. So it's very difficult to, I suppose, um, diagnose. Uh, so, and by and large in Europe, so 600,000, like I said, in, in, in Ireland, probably around 10 million in UK next door probably 80 million uh, in Europe. Uh, worldwide, we reckon there's approximately roughly 1 billion. Wow. Uh, so They're startling figures. It is, mm. They are yeah. harrowing figures. It's the most prevalent neurological disorder out there. Now, it's not a life-threatening disorder, uh, but it's very, very disabling. So uh, just to give you a few stats, uh, in Ireland, for example, the impact on the Irish economy is around 260 million euros on a yearly basis. Uh, as we speak today, there will be between 13, 1, 3, and 15, 1, 5, 15,000 attacks. Same yesterday, same the day before, and same tomorrow. So on a weekly basis, you have more 100 plus K attacks. Has an impact, you know, there's a social burden, but there's also an economic burden because there's millions of days lost to productivity. Of course. Uh, also, uh, migraine uh, is stigmatized and trivialized. I know it's just, I'm sure it's only a headache. It's actually far more complex than that. Mm -hmm. When you may think that, you know, in employment terms, a migrainer is four to six times higher, more likely to be unemployed or have to go part-time, uh, it's actually staggering numbers. Um, it's kind of one of those hidden disability to a certain degree, uh, which is not really spoken about. So our, our role obviously is to debunk the myth and so on. But there's a, Ireland is a specificity as well when it comes to migraine. No surprise there. Uh, there's a deficit of knowledge by and large in Europe or worldwide about, uh, uh, suppose, research, but also primary care in migraine insofar that uh, I would say in Ireland, we know that at undergraduate level, uh, the training around headache disorders and migraine is less than four hours. So very often you have a migrainer who may show up at a primary care center, be it a GP or a general hospital, who may know more about the condition than the HCP. And the reason is, you know, migraine is a bit of a, a complex one. There's no biomarkers per se. It's an exclusion game. So if you go for an MRI, it may not necessarily pick on something. So you, you really need to 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 have a, a huge knowledge. So there's questions, there's obviously diary and so on, but you, in order to pinpoint what migraine is and what type of migraine, it's pretty much accepted that it takes roughly seven years to be properly diagnosed. Uh, you also have to add that we think that 50% of the migraineurs are not diagnosed or not properly diagnosed and do self-medicate. So you have a problem of self-medication, overuse medication and so on. So it's a complex one, uh, at there, and uh, Ireland, you have the Dublin and the rest of the country, so that's the great divide. You have public versus private, 
and this lack of knowledge. So you have multiple layers of complexity, which really are a recipe for disaster, or call it a bit more politically uh, correct, uh, a perfect storm. So um, that that's migraine. And because it's not life-threatening, sometimes it's not necessarily taken seriously. However, it's one of the most disabling conditions out there. Are there subject matter experts in some of the hospitals? They do. So uh, the way actually it, it's set up, so you have some uh, neurology and edX centers across the country. So Beaumont is, is one. Uh, you have neurologists with an interest in migraine, uh, for St. James, Vincent, and so on. Um, I would say uh, at GP level, the knowledge is actually not optimal. Uh, at neurologist level, it depends who you talk to. Some have an interest in it or not. Now, there's one, I suppose, cohort when it's encouraging. We see some signs, good encouraging signs, where it's clinical nurse uh, specialist in some neurology centers as part of the Slange Care program on the pathway to care for headache in a country. So we, we're starting to see people being hired and being in place regionally. And I, that, it does help. But, you know, from a system perspective, I think we are still lagging behind, even compared to the NHS, for example. So, uh, but there's improvement. I think it's taken far more seriously. Uh, we do our own advocacy work, but also the Neurological Alliance of Ireland has actually undertaken a campaign the last two years about patients deserve better, which was to get neurology nurses uh, and some with migraine specialty uh, out there. And it's been, you know, the, the government and, and the Minister for Disability uh, and the Minister for Health and the HSE have responded favorably. But, you know, it's very difficult. So we, we see some traction. We are not where we would like to be and we're still lagging behind compared to the rest of, of Europe. Of course. Can the severity of the symptoms vary a lot from person to person? Completely, because it really depends what type of migraine we, you may have. So let's say if you have hemiplegic migraine, which is a very rare, it's 0, 0 0.1. However, it does exist. Uh, the symptoms are pretty much akin of a stroke to a certain degree. It's a very scary one. Uh, it can be chronic or on a daily basis. This one is one of the most disabling, super severe. You have to go on high technology medicine, uh, injectables, all this type of thing. So you can barely function. You know, it's very hard to predict how your week's going to be. Uh, then you have vestibular migraine, for example, uh, which is a lot of visible, visual disturbance. You have migraine with aura, with that aura. Uh, you have abdominal migraine. So it, it's a complex one. Uh, I'm referring to the point I was at learning earlier. It's not an homogeneous condition. So you have six or seven or eight, and you can add some other conditions. And sometimes migraine is only collateral. You may have migraine as a part of an acquired brain injury, or you can be an epileptic and having migraine. So uh, sometimes it's not the denominator in terms of chronic condition. And I think that makes it pretty difficult, uh, as opposed to other chronic conditions where you have biomarkers mm -hmm. and it can be almost identified relatively quickly. Uh, it takes a while. So. Uh, you need to be fair with the HCP community, which is healthcare practitioner. Uh, you know, it, it's it's not an easy one. And because it's not life-threatening, I think the research, actually even worldwide, has been a hit and miss. There's been a lot of development the last 10 years, in particular around uh, preventative as opposed to acute uh, medication. But uh, we're not there just yet because I don't think we have pinpoint what is the trigger uh, in terms of, you know, we know in 70% of the cases, it's hereditary. Uh, but beyond that, I think we need more research. Mm. Uh, and I would have to say that a lot of other conditions uh, with more tragic outcomes are obviously taking a uh, uh, support priority over it. And if you go through the various types of migraine, I was shocked to find there were so many. And also how severe some of them are. Oh, absolutely. So um, migraine is not a, an LTI, which is a long-term uh, illness scheme. So therefore, there's no legal framework per se. It's a bit of a reasonable accommodation act for in education. But it, it makes things very, because it's not known, and there's a lot of myth there. So we try to debunk myth uh, with um, some of our services. But really, for example, uh, there's not a week that goes by when I'm not receiving a letter 
for requiring assistance. Uh, E.g., for example, uh, people working on the factory uh, floor and developing migraine and shifts is not good. So any chronic conditions love routine, for example. If you're starting to do shift, it's migraine on steroids, no pun intended. Uh, so that's really important. So what a lot of people ask us is, I sign a lot of letters outlining what it is and what it is not. Mm. And it goes back to the local, uh, either the company doctor or the company OT and so on. And, uh, and just to equip people, and I try to debunk a few myths, I say, that's a very serious condition. People are not slackers. They want to work. They want yeah. to function. Yeah. Also, should I say, uh, one of the myths out there, it's an entry level. Uh, yes. No, it's not. It, it, I have nothing against uh, administrative assistant, but it's, that's not everybody gets it. You know, it does not discriminate. Uh, we know of uh, people who are very, very uh, senior in companies who suffer from migraine. Some do talk about it, some don't, because you have to come out to a certain degree. So, but we have done uh, one of our programs is to do a lot of workplace talks. That's something we have put in place the last three years, and we have done roughly thirty-five talks. You know, you name it: Microsoft, CSO. Uh, all these type of organizations. And sometimes what we do, we invite somebody from the organization to talk about their own experience because I'm a firm believer of show me, don't tell me. And in some organizations, we have people who are very senior. Uh, in Microsoft, for example, a general manager uh, came forward and said, I suffer from migraine and here is my life with migraine and had to pull out for some meetings internationally, cannot travel, all these type of things. So it's very limitative really want to have a career. Uh, so it's, it's, it's one of those uh, uh, misunderstanding uh, about what the conditions on what it's not about, but you know, we, it needs to be spoken about, uh, hence our role in my Island. Do you find that those organisations are receptive to you and also to the person who's suffering from migraine? Yes, I, I would say... Um, Yes, you know, in a nutshell, it's yes. Uh, systemically, probably not. Individually, the companies are some are more advanced when it comes to well-being, uh, con condition, and so on. The the angle we have taken is really talk uh, when we 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 propose a talk. We often our key contacts, for example, are HR, uh, diversity and inclusion, uh, well-being unit manager and so on, but typically it tends to be HR. And what we tend to tell them is really, oh, LGBTQ plus has been a massive, massive uh, inward in terms of talking about diversity the last 15 years. However, if we really want to have a 360 view of what diversity is all about, I think we need to factor, push the narrative a bit further now, which is around hidden disability, but it could also, also be ageism, all this type of ableism. So when we I often talk to a key contact while migraine is my product, I suppose, to a certain degree. I often use the overarching principle of chronic condition, whatever it is. We are an aging population. Uh, the workforce is aging. Uh, not everybody is under 21 working for a tech company. Yeah. At some point, you will acquire or you already have a chronic condition. Are you becoming suddenly a write-off? No. Uh, Fujitsu, for example, at worldwide level, uh, have introduced a program on migraine, and there was you know, accommodations, adjustment, work patterns, and so on. What they realized is when you have a proper program in place, you start to share dividends in terms of productivity and creativity, uh, and hence shareholders. Because let's not kid ourselves, you know, a company is commercially driven; they're here to make money. Yes, but if they can make money while still having a duty of care towards the personal, I think it's a double whammy for, for everybody. So now uh, we, we know Novartis has done something similar as well. Uh, so at scale, it seems to work. Ireland is a bit more complicated because 95% of uh, the economy, the, the company size is probably under 50 or even 25. Yeah. So, uh, and some of those uh, companies don't even have a HR function and so on. So probably not necessarily have that luxury of doing things. So 
the talks we have done are pretty much in what I call tier one, you know, big companies, big organizations. Uh, we need to find a way ourselves as Migraine Ireland in order to be able to disseminate this information uh, through, uh, suppose, the rest of the, the economic landscape in Ireland. Uh, it's a challenge, uh, but, you know, we up for it. Can practices like yoga and mindfulness be of any help? In yes. For people like so, uh, migraine, so you have the way to approach migraine, so you have acute treatments, you have preventative treatments, and then we have what we call alternative or, pre you know, the alternative, let's say, or other treatments. I, I'm going to put a caveat there. Uh, yes, to your question, Patrick, yes, yoga, pilates, all these type of things. Uh, two caveats. So it may work for yeah. some individuals, may not work for others. Mm. Anyway, meditating, mindfulness could be good in any shape or form, whether you're a migrainer or not. In this area, there's a huge industry that has developed the last seven years. Uh, and it's a bit the wild, wild west. Yeah. Uh, there's some cowboys and cowgirls oh, there, course, people preying yeah. on vulnerability, mm -hmm. uh, crazy stuff from transfusions to supplements, this, this, this. Us at Migraine Ireland, uh, we, we, first, we don't endorse product. Uh, and if we are talking about products, they need to be medically sanctioned, e.g. Uh, clinical studies and so on and so on. So I still speak uh, to some people who, you know, are a few snake oil merchants there uh, because I want to be informed. Uh, but also what we see, which is actually far more encouraging from a digitization perspective and medical device, we see some companies who are really making some inroads the last four or five years. So, for example, Migrant Ireland, we are, have signed an MOU, which is a memorandum of understanding, okay. with a company called Migrant Vention in Estonia when it's around telemedicine. Uh, so, e-diary, it's super important to have a diary in Migrant because yeah. you're doing half of the job, you understand your patterns and so on. Uh, then we have a nurse dashboard. You could even do prescription and talk to a physician, not in Ireland because there's so much red tape at the moment. So, but... Migraine, not having biomarkers, would be a poster child for telemedicine to a certain degree. So we have signed an MOU and we are piloting some stuff. We've been talking to uh, another company in Scandinavia uh, recently around, uh, Brain Nordic actually, uh, around uh, a dynamic e-diary. And, uh, and this week, uh, I was talking to a company from, Scandin from uh, uh, Netherlands around uh, Alpha Brain, uh, which actually specialized in epilepsy but wants to run a project with us at your open level on having a device that may be able to detect or predict an attack uh, via brainwaves. So super embryonic at this stage, but there's some exciting stuff there yeah. as well. Uh, other conditions like diabetes, for example, have changed dramatically because now you have a sensor. Mm. You can predict, you know where you're going, all these type of things. You can go to a doctor yeah. and they, you know, actually I'm diabetic. I went on Monday and I say, here's, and even before the blood test result. So uh, things are becoming reliable. So things are changing. So to finish on your original questions, Patrick, I think, yes, there's some alternative stuff out there. May work around mindfulness. I think it's important because there's always a level of anxiety when you experience a chronic condition. Yeah. It's not plain sailing. Uh, you overanalyze or your head is spinning, all these type of things. Uh, if there's a, a small symptom, you think it's worse than it may be. So, yes, it does help. Uh, by the same token, uh, be wary of what's out there. Yeah. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, talk to your healthcare practitioner or GP or nurse district. You know, it's super important that you don't embark on something, especially if there's some money involved. Mm. Uh, be wary. Do you find GPs are becoming more progressive in dealing with migraine. The past would say, take over the counter, pay medication and go and lie in the dark room. Uh, now. I would say, uh, yes and no. Yes, because I think there's a new generation of GP out there. Um, they understand, as Patrick, actually mindfulness, all this type of thing. So I think they're probably far more open to a progressive approach 
which may not always in, involve medication, for example. Uh, and actually, they're more curious. Uh, I don't want to fall into the ger- generational trap, but yeah. there's a bit. Yeah. Also, you have now an influx of doctors, uh, which I have not necessarily been trained uh, in Ireland, and they also provide a different angle. Of course. Uh, they have a different training. They've been exposed to other things. So, yes, I would say it's anecdotal. We hear things. Is it systemic? No, not just yet. So who, tell us about the organization itself. When was that set so up? Migraine, and how does it support so people my, with migraine? migraine Ireland, the organization. So we are 30 years uh, in existence this year. Um, our mission, so advocacy, education, service delivery. And I suppose uh, under this, I'm going to talk corporate for two minutes. Like we organize in channels. So uh, our first channel is general public or general patient support. And what we do there is on a monthly basis, we deliver one, two, three or four webinars online. Uh, We facilitate them. We invite doctors, professors, uh, nurses, PT, pharmacists to talk and educate people around around migraine. It's for the general public. It's free of charge. Uh, second channel, which I touch on a bit, is workplace. When we do uh, workplace talks to company, so lunch and learn, all these type of things we've done, it's 35. The third channel is we have an info line on migrant support when we have a nurse in place. And it's really you know, taking calls, signposting, helping with health literacy, helping you to understand what the doctors have said, uh, helping you to write down the questions you should be asking and all these type of things. Uh, under that channel as well, we are a slant care partner. Uh, what we mean by that is we have a memorandum of understanding with Beaumont Hospital, whereby if we identify people who may require some psychologic support, and it happens quite a lot when you suffer from a chronic condition, not only migraine, uh, we refer them to Beaumont Psychology where they get assessed and then they embarked on a eight weeks program. We also ourselves deliver our own self-management course uh, on a six weeks, similar, different, but very similar. Uh, we do info documents as well. We deliver HCP medical uh, uh, CPD points. What's cert. That? It's a continuous uh, continuous CPD, continuous performance uh, development. Uh, I think. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's just uh, accreditation for HCP, just to show that actually they keep up to uh, they stay abreast of development in a particular field. Okay. Uh, for nurse, GPs, and neurologist. Uh, so we deliver this type of search as well. And we actually, under that channel, we also have a, a medical editorial panel, which is kind of a medical advisory board. So we have the ex-neurology lead uh, at national level, Hola, the man sitting on it. We have a clinical nurse. We have a doctor from uh, the UK and so on and so on. So everything we do is actually sanctioned right. medically as well because it's super important that you are precise. Mm. Uh, and the, the other channel is uh, communications. We do a lot of comms on social media, and not only. Uh, we do radio interviews with yeah. access other areas, for example. Uh, so, but uh, it's super important. So roughly, uh, it's a part of debunking the myth as well. We Every day, you're going to see a post, we do the standard social media. Uh, we we'll clock roughly 2 million views on a yearly basis organically for an organization of five people on good days. Wow, so that point, And then we have support functions like a lot of things. So that's us in a nutshell. We do a bit of research uh, by that, what I mean, we are not a foundation and we don't have a lot of money, but we assist researchers, uh, uh, whether it's wearable in university, when they do a, a wearable uh, research about wearable and migraine, uh, psychology, and so on and so on. Uh, now, we may come across as big when I outline everything we do, but we, like any charities in Ireland, we do things on the shoestring. Uh, so we would love to scale up of our, our services, but we are... We are having an impact and uh, we have obviously a metrics in place and all, all these type of things. Now, I just want to, uh, for context purpose, and uh, maybe the people who are listening may not be aware, but 70%, 70% of the uh, disability services in Ireland are delivered by charities. Yes. So, uh, you know that. <laughs> you know that. So, and, and, and migraine is no exception. Actually, migraine from, uh, is sitting in disability, but we are in neurology. Uh, so it's you know it, 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 funnily enough in a way it, it tends to to show 
that people are not quite sure where to put us. Uh, and I, and it, it's, it's an ambiguous, uh, I suppose, condition, but uh, I have a, I'm probably the weakest link in my organization. I have kick-ass staff and they do things day in, day out, way better than I would ever do. They're very uh, modest. <laughs> but they are really, really, really brilliant. And uh, for us now, the key is, is to scale up. Good. How are you funded? So uh, partially funded by the HSE. We are actually a section 39, a small one. Yeah. Um, we are pharma on projects uh, and they've been good to us. Uh, we have run some events, we have run some cycles and stuff like that in the past. Individual uh, donations. Uh, if anybody out there wants to give to uh, Migraine Ireland, it's migraine.ie. Just click the donate button, please. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, no, but joke apart, uh, like anything else, we do things. You know, uh, every single euro is directed to services because we, our salaries are via the HSE. So everything out there goes to, we send diaries, paper diaries, and we know there's some uh, download stations on, on our website. But I think it's pretty important to, to understand that, you know, in the light of service delivery, we would love to do more. Uh, but the sticky floor is money. Are there any fundraising events coming up? At the moment, we had to postpone our cycling event. So we're going to have some stuff out there for the 30 years. So our throughout social media, but uh, I would say on a day to day basis, our website is accessible. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so feel free, even a euro or three euros. What you could do if you're a migrainer or a non migrainer, you can also become a member. And uh, for 36 euros or less, uh, you get access to a peer to peer support online. It's a close. So wow. migrainers speak to each other, but it's close, it's private, nobody. I'd so say yeah, that's very useful yeah, to yeah, somebody. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially if you're newly diagnosed, for example. Of course. Uh, also, we provide a, a member magazine, and, a, and then we obviously have a, you know, the one-to-one -one with the nurse on a, on a quarterly basis, if you want to. If somebody wants to get in touch with you, they've just been diagnosed with migraine, how do they get in touch? I would say... So first point of call, migraine.ie, the website, go to the info line. So talk to us either via email or talk. Naomi, our nurse, will be delighted to talk to you and uh, help you sometimes to de-dramatize a bit yeah. what it is and what it is not and equip you with the right level of uh, uh, information. I think it's important when you have a con conditions to have uh, a balanced approach to what it is and what it is not. And You are not alone. It's one of our tagline as well, but you make you realize that you are not alone and you, uh, you're going to be surrounded by people who actually understand it or not judging your condition, not dismissing it or discarding it altogether. Very good. Pascal, thank you so much for thank coming on the show. Thank you, Pascal. Uh, you're, very, you're very welcome. I'm glad to be here. <laughs>